Oh, okay. Hello, Sally. Wonderful to meet you. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful and, to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for writing this book. It's actually pretty new. So the book, uh, the English name is called Rising Together and I have this Chinese version printed in Chinese. It was actually 2023, right? It was 2023. The The book that I did before that, How Women Rise, was very successful in China. It still got it's still got a lot of interest in that. And I think it's uh, still in print. Yeah, 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 I know. And then you have, that's one of your seven books you published before, right? Is this the eighth book or something? Because yes, you write. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I was, it was actually very, it's a, it's it's great fun reading this book because there are so many things in the book that I, like can flashback. I was like, oh, I've I've seen that person, I've seen that person. Of course, different names, but <laughs> so for for our audience, I just want to say a few things. I think first of all, who's Sally? So Sally herself has basically spent her life doing leadership coaching, especially for women. Um, but so like she mentioned her previous book how called How Women Rise, which addressed some of the very common issues that face women in their career, career advancement. Yes. Um, and this book around um, uh, basically around inclusion. Yes. And in workplace. Yeah. Uh, called Rising Together. Um, and it was also a very timely book because I think the work culture, I'm sure Sally is a better speaker to that has actually changed in the last three decades, right? Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> quite a bit. And then, so it was very interesting. So the book basically addressed a very current challenge in a lot of places in the, in the workplace. I'm actually current in Tokyo. It's very interesting because you mentioned like the experience you had in Tokyo as well. I mean, it's very different culturally, of course, from the US or from China, but a lot of companies talk about um, we talk about inclusion inclusion as well and and face the challenge of how to do it and then this book then came out um addressing especially those challenges um and i think the other thing and the last thing i want to say before i um you know throw to sally is i like this book because it not only talk about the issue uh, and talk about what the problem is and and why you know it's you know this is not becoming a, a you know a better workplace for especially women or especially for um, those groups that who feel they were somehow at a certain disadvantage. But also most importantly, it's actually almost like a working manual of, of how to do it and how to address it. Um, and it's very useful, it's very practical. And there are a lot of very real examples. And that's what I said in the beginning, because when I was reading the book, although of course, you know, for, for privacy purpose, Sally has hide their names, but a lot of the examples are very, very common um, in workplace. So it's very practical. It really addressed the how. Um, so with that introduction, first of all, if you're listening to this, if you're looking this live, you can find this in Chinese Chinese version of this book in the shopping cart. So you can place an order. <laughs> Thank um, you. And then with that, I probably will, um, uh, you know, have my first question to Sally is like, uh, like what triggered you to write this book? Again, of course you can say, hey, there's an issue. It's, it seems very clear when you're reading the book. But in your very long career, I'm sure you're faced with clients all the time. You, you're, you know, in constant discussion with, you know, different clients and different situations. Um, uh, when did this idea come about that, okay, I'm going to write this book. This is a new big issue that doesn't seem to have a book that addresses it. Like, tell us a bit of that thought process uh, behind uh, the, gener you know, the, the initiation of the writing project. Of course, you know, uh, I was have really been thinking about this topic for a very long time. I'd written a book in 1995 called The Web of Inclusion, which was the first time that the language of inclusion was used in the context of work and the workplace and workplace culture. So I've done hundreds and hundreds of workshops around the world on inclusion, but the topic has become, I think, more urgent than in the past, partly because organizations have such a diverse workforce now, and they finally gotten the message that especially when it comes to women, that they need to be skilled at not only attracting, but also retaining and engaging women. And, but they're not sure how to do that. And uh, that's one of the reasons I opened the book with that anecdote, which was real when I was speaking at the Construction Super Conference in Las Vegas. So there were about 6,000 men that there and about 250 women. And they'd asked me to do a program on women's leadership. So I figured it would be women there. 
And it was actually a majority of men who came. And so I was surprised and I wasn't sure quite, you know, how to talk about it because I was prepared to talk about the habits and behaviors that get in the way of women as they seek to move forward, which is the topic of, of how women rise. So I was asking the men why they had come, what inspired them to come to a workshop on women's leadership. And I heard what I was not surprised that we need to get better at being a place that women enjoy working so we can keep them. We have a labor shortage, et cetera. But then one man stood up and he said very memorably, um, we hope you're not going to waste your time telling us why this is important. We know why it is, we get it, we understand, but we don't know how to do it. That's what we would like to hear from you. So the minute I heard that, I thought that's my next book. I'm gonna be able to answer that question uh, if I can research a book on how do we do inclusion? Because I think a lot of the models are very theoretical, they're not practical. And that's what I was trying to provide. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, I read that book. I read that story and it with a lot of laughs. You mentioned the room packed with men. It's construction, right? It's like what to expect. Exactly. And then the fact that people struggle with with how to do it. And then the fact you say frameworks are very um, conceptual. So you're looking for ways um, to give people sort of a handbook of how to do it, right? Um, and then the book indeed did that, as I said, I know many of you haven't read it. I did read it, I have a pleasure of reading it. And then it, it was very practical. And then, but it was a, was a, interestingly, the book was arranged in two parts. The first part is around triggers. And the second part is basically, you know, you know, how to do, what to do with it. And then the triggers part is really interesting. Um, and you listed eight triggers. Um, when basic people feel excluded, right? And then, and everyone is very classic, I have to say. <laughs> but maybe before we get to the individual triggers, you know, tell us why you use sort of triggers to you as a framework. And then, do they are they omnipresent in all, or like how do you categorize them, and why you're you know putting this eight um, as a framework um, to cat you know to to basically to explain. Um, what are the sort of source of the issue here? Well, the reason I wanted to look at triggers, I had the idea when I started writing the book, I was just going to focus on inclusive behaviors because I think that in organizations, in my experience, which is quite a bit, uh, what I see is they're focusing immediately on unconscious bias. That is what people are thinking rather than, mm -hmm. than presenting behavior. So I was trying to think of how I was going to answer this man at the construction super conference. So I wanted to present lists of beha inclusive behaviors that they could practice, encourage others to practice, and it would create more inclusive cultures. But as I started writing that list, I realized that many of us understand and know what inclusive behaviors are and look like. The problem is we struggle to, to practice them because certain things will set off emotional reactions in us. And that makes it difficult for us to behave in ways that we know would serve us. Like one of the big triggers in the book is this trigger of it's not fair, this feeling that we're being treated unfairly and that someone else was promoted, for example, into a job where we thought we'd be promoted <clears throat> or someone is always called on in a meeting, that kind of thing. So that trigger of it's not fair, we need to deal with that trigger before we can then sort of authentically and in a positive way act inclusively. So that's what that's why I started with triggers because I realized, no, it's it's not enough to just know what these are. We're held back. You know, we feel we're excluded from networks, things like that. So, so that's what I wanted to address specifically. And, and I chose the eight because, you know, I come from a perspective of coaching and doing seminars, master classes and workshops. So these are the things that from my experience, I see are most likely 
to make people reluctant to behave in 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 ways that they that they know they should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then as I said, I think this is um, um, based on a lot of real examples. And Sally yourself must have had inter interacted with over a thousand people, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so like it's 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 uh, so that, that's why I think for for people who are reading this book, you you will definitely find a piece of yourself in there because they're so classic, and then um and I think it's it's quite common, but it's really based on a lot of Sally's years of experience interacting with real people in different settings. And I have to say this because usually I, I want to make this statement because um the EI thing, well, people typically see it as a American thing now, yeah, because American corporations do a lot. Uh, but it's not true. And then I think Sally yourself has actually had clients in 35 different countries or something like that, right? Is it? 37, you... certainly. And I've done a lot of, you know, I did DEI programs last year in Singapore, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I travel all, uh, these are in-persons. I travel all over the world, Brazil, et cetera. So this isn't a sample of my experience working with Americans or American companies. This is, these are my experiences, again, as you said, 37 countries, whether it's Turkey, uh, in the Middle East, in Dubai, uh, around the world, really very much so, Japan. So that's where I'm drawing from. And I think that what has been so fascinating once I started thinking about both triggers and inclusive behaviors is to see how much really we have in common when it comes to this. It's more, you know, the whole idea of diversity and inclusion to some degree did begin in the United States, um, but it is worldwide now and it is so common in global countries of every kind. Yeah, I want to make that statement because I think for people who are, you know, looking at Sally's profile or thinking about this issue, saying, oh, this is not relevant to us. But I think it's uh, that's as as what Sally was saying. Um, I think the book actually addressed a lot of cases that's very, um, very common. Like I I use one example. She mentioned this fair a fairness thing, right? I think the first trigger she mentioned in her book is on this client whose name is Jane, or you can call it call her a Chinese name, right? Whatever the right. name is. So Right. And then by basically saying that, um, you know, if you follow me, you'll see how common this is basically saying that she made a um, some kind of comment or statement in the meeting, uh, but people sort of ignored it. Right. And then 10 minutes later, there was this guy, um, Mark, in, in, in the book, well, call it a Chinese name, Xiao Qiang, <laughs> made yeah. this name. Yeah, made the same comments, right? And then suddenly it got picked up and say, well, everybody's saying, well, Mark or Xiao Chang, that's a great idea. Like, you know, this is brilliant. And of course, then, you know, Jen would feel, hey, this is my idea. And this happened over and over again. And then, you know, like then how she dealt with it, of course, she was angry. She's not happy. And she thinks it's not fair. And then the way she dealt with it is she, you know, run into another female colleague, you know, in the coffee chat, right? And then complain to her, how this is what happened. And that's it, right? Because she didn't feel there is another way other than just pointing it out. And she feel angry. She feel not seen. Um, and then that was basically, of course, leading to a sense of um, not being included, right? So she felt, okay, I don't belong here. Um, and that's kind of how it is. So that's a very classic trigger. If you think about it, it doesn't matter if you're in the American company, Japanese company, Chinese company. <laughs> I think this, you know, people would have had that feeling. And I like how Sally has framed it and saying, like, how do you deal with it, right? Because I think usually people would say, hey, well, then since the company's talking about DEI, I should raise this issue to the leader and say, this is, you know, Mark guy or whoever, this other guy who made this comment um, is wrong. Um, but wait a minute, that's not the right way to deal with, because if you really did it, you know, you established a lot of enemies, <laughs> right? And then probably doesn't doesn't help, you know, solving the issue. And and Sally made this beautiful example of how you should deal with it. I think I have it. Um, but basically saying that, you know, we should, um notice and accept we're being triggered that's number one yes um, but without framing it in a self-interested way so like the way i said it was a self-interest okay you know it's my idea mark stole it or you know you, you know though you guys saw him saw him didn't see me so that's a self-interested way so it, it suddenly becomes me versus mark or me versus whoever made the comment right so i think that's what sally was saying and then 
And there are three bullet points, which is beautifully said. She said, the first one is that we don't tell ourselves that this shouldn't happen. We accept that it did. So basically saying like, you know, it's right. accepting. Accepting doesn't mean this is right, but you know, we cannot deny the fact that it happened. And the second bullet um, inside this book said, we don't tell ourselves that I can't deal with it. We accept that we need to. Yeah, it's not like, say, okay, this is too bad. The company's, okay, the culture is wrong. Um, they're too dominant. You know, I don't belong. You know, I will complain to my um, female colleague and that's it. That's basically accepting that I can't deal with this. But, but Sally said, no, we accept that we need to. And the third one said, we don't tell ourselves that I can't believe this person would. <laughs> and <it's, laughs> um, you know, oh, I can't believe you You would just remember what Mark said, not me. I, I said it three times or something like that, right? We accept yeah. that. We and and you were saying like, um, so basically saying that, you know, like it's it doesn't matter whether Jane or this woman believe this alternative story is true or not, even if she's pretty sure that was the right idea, you know, that was the fact. But you still need to create a positive narrative. I think that's your point. So like, how do you actually untangle yourself from the situation or from the negative um, narrative and come come out through accepting and seeing there's a way of building a positive narrative so you can take power over the situation, right? Um, I think this is an excellent example. Again, it doesn't matter where you work, um, like in what, what language you speak in your, as a working um, language. The situation is very common. I think what Sally has offered in this particular example, all those things are very simple, like, you know, from denying to accepting, you know, from, you know, being self-interested to see, hey, you know, I, I, I can deal with it. And also, I, I, I actually didn't say that I want Sally to, to tell us, like, then how do you, how do you untangle? I think you had a beautiful story um, or, or language and saying, okay, in this case, what could Jane do? right? Which is not the narrative win. What can we do to build a positive narrative? That's exactly right. It's kind of a model of awareness and then acceptance and then action. And that's what's important because going to human resources or lodging a complaint, we want to reserve that for things that are really not acceptable, active sexual harassment, um, you know, racist comments, whatever that is, but not for, oh, they didn't notice me or someone spoke my idea. That's just the reality of the workplace. The thing is, when we have a negative narrative about that, like, oh, he's trying to steal my idea or no one ever notices me or I get talked over and I have no visibility. This is the trigger of visibility. When we have the, that negative narrative, it doesn't lead uh, leave us any path to positive action, none. We don't have a way to move that forward. If we reframe that narrative, and as you said, it doesn't matter if we, even if we believe the negative story is true. If we can reframe it, oh, oh, maybe he was echoing my idea to show that he supported it, or Maybe he didn't hear what I said and we're thinking along the same lines, or maybe he was just rephrasing what I'd said because he felt that it would get more notice from some other people. Whatever that story is that we tell ourselves, that then gives us a way to move forward. We can, uh, if we're in person, we can go up to him afterwards and say, oh, I'm so glad you, you liked my idea. Um, I'm glad you agree with me. Maybe there's some way we could move it forward together. If you're, if it's not in person, you can send a text or an email or however you're communicating to that person and say, very glad you echoed my idea in that meeting. Want to talk about it. Just something simple like that. Because what this does then is it gives you a positive path toward, you know, a positive way of acting on it. But it also gives you the opportunity to potentially develop a relation, a positive relationship with that other person, make them an ally, embed them in your network of support. Whereas if you're just being upset about it, you don't have any path to do that. And so that's what I'm trying to provide is a different way in every case and for all the different triggers that I identify, a different way of thinking about it, a different way of framing it so that you the whole purpose here is is enabling you to take a positive action mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's beautiful because exactly. I think that's why this book is so so interesting and so useful because they actually gave you the language. Right? Yeah. <laughs> basically said, what do you do? Like, I think this is exactly what Sally said was in, in her book. Because, oh, I am so glad. But, uh, Mark Grace with what I just said. Thank yeah. you. Right? <laughs> I use Thank that. You. Yeah, you're not. You're making a great with Mark. You're also recognizing people who have recognized Mark's idea, which is the same as your idea. So basically you were saying that. And also um, Sally said in the book, so instead of grabbing your female colleague for ultimately unproductive gripe session, right? So like, you know, you're, you're basically you're, you're venting. You could intercept Mark as the meeting broke up. So it's great to know you and I think alike on this issue. I'd love to discuss how we could move ahead, right? Or so like there are many things like Sally putting in specific language and behavior you could have. Um, which is very powerful and very simple too. And it's very simple, but it's it's actually very powerful when you know what to say. Um, but I think I want to go back to what Sally, you mentioned, uh, the three keywords, which are acting really essence of a of, of lot of the methodology in your book is the three steps. It's, it's basically saying one is aware, awareness, right? So you, okay, something happened. You know, I have this mental awareness. Okay, this is, you know, I'm, I'm being triggered. <laughs> Some exactly. A sentence or so you know stole my idea and second is acceptance right so okay once i have a, a being aware of it i i do not deny it or, or do not get, i do not allow myself to keep being triggered on the triggered state i say okay i'm angry I'm, i i need to get you know revenge or i need to leave <laughs> but you're accepting something so this is what happened okay this is you know so and so said that i said that you know and then also as um we mentioned earlier in Sally's book, talk about, okay, then I can deal with it, right? And then the third is action. Okay, then after you are um, aware of it, you accept it, and then the actions you can take, which are the sentences or the behavior you could adopt based on what um, Sally put in the book. So I think those the three A's is, is very essential. It's basically Sally used that framework in each one of the triggers to talk about, you know, how do you see that? What is the trigger? And, you know, once you see that, you know, what's your kind of inner process, <laughs> right? Yes. Dissociating yourself with the situation and then the actions you can take from that. So that's that's really beautifully laid out um, on that. Um, but I think one thing I want to say, I, re I really like it too, like even on that, that's not the end of it. Because I think you mentioned this very beautiful thing called um, authenticity trap, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is also very common. I got the same question that people will say, oh, OK, that's brilliant. That's great. You gave me this language. But I'm very angry. Right. I'm just you know, I can use the language to pretend I'm a cooperative person in workplace. But this is not authentic. You know, the authentic me is angry <laughs> or the <laughs> authentic. Right, I'll think to me saying that it's not fair. You're just merely, you know, sort of, a, you know, putting sugar coating on it and saying this is the language you should use. Well, I can learn it, but aren't we saying leadership is about being authentic? Um, and I'll hand over to Sally because she actually, you know, has basically exactly on that point uh, elaborated, you know, why we have such such a thing called um, authenticity trap. I think you're quoting your colleague, right, um, yeah. uh, Marshall. Marshall. <laughs> Yeah, so go ahead. I think this is a this is a very sharp and beautiful piece of the book. <laughs> uh, well, it's very important because we, we have, there is a, a lot of urging of people to be authentic in the workplace, understand where it comes from. It's a positive thing. Too many people, especially for example, women or other people who come from outside the traditional leadership mainstream, uh, if you're in Japan, that is a Japanese man. If you're in China, a Chinese man. If you're in Mexico, a Mexican man. So if you come from outside that leadership mainstream, then you may have felt you had to suppress who you really were. And it's a very positive thing. Or if you were gay, you suppressed who you were, et cetera. You didn't, you didn't let people know. You are trying to protect that. Uh, so it's a positive thing. However, we've been urged to value our authenticity or to, you know, tell it like it is so often that I think it's created a trap. So number one, it's given a lot of people permission to talk in very negative ways about other people. Well, I'm just saying it like it is. You know, I call them like I see it. You know, I'm an authentic human being. That's not good. That doesn't help create you know, inclusive teams or organizations or even functional ones. It, it's very divisive. But the other thing is 
And I see this a lot when I give this advice, you know, in coaching, for example, somebody will say, well, I don't want to be fake. You know, I, I value my own authenticity and I actually don't believe that story. So why would I tell myself, you know, that this person was just, you know, echoing what I thought? Well, what's your goal? Do you want behavior that serves you and moves you forward? Or do you want to remain stuck with what you believe is your most, most authentic, which is often just your first response? It's a first response. Every one of us has changed. We know we've changed. I think things that I never thought 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I've changed. I've evolved. I've grown. It's called human growth. So we, we, you know, we can't remain stuck like this is, this is not authentic to me. And I think we want to balance authenticity with being very professional. Um, but in the case of doing, of finding our way to more useful ways to de uh, deal with what triggers us, authenticity can be a real, real trap. So there's more flexibility, plus which, guess what? We might be wrong. You know, we might believe that person was trying to steal our idea and he actually didn't hear us. So we misinterpret things all the time. I know I do. So often what we feel is our most authentic response is just our immediate response. And the more we think about it, the more we think, yeah, well, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, no, indeed, because I think that's that's a, such an important point because I think um, the and I I'm, I'm glad you call it out the authenticity trap because it's a trap it is a good thing of course it's a good thing but what is speak your what does speak your mind mean like speaking your mind right does it mean every voice in my mind I speak out that's my mind <laughs> that's not true right because we know like there's so many noises in your mind um, and there's so many especially when you're in the trigger state. Right. You know, anything blur out of your mouth is just something that kind of passed by when you are triggered. So I think that's a probably big misunderstanding. Say, OK, anything that's sort of just, you know, bubble up in my mind when, when I say it out is authentic. That's not true. Like, so I think, you know, I used to say that I think, you know, we need to learn to differentiate what is our inner voice. So is it something that coming authentically from you or this is something we we were when we were kidnapped? Right. When we're, when we're emotionally kidnapped, there's a lot of vocabulary around it, too. And, you know, if you're not able to differentiate it, then basically anything you come out is when you're what what you say. Lots of them are basically noises or distractions. Um, so that I think what you, you were talking about in the trap, but like how do we, you know, differentiate or identify the trap? What does does being professional mean being fake? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it means being a, a little more thoughtful, a little more disciplined. And and it, you're exactly right because when you use the word kidnap, because in fact, that's what being triggered kind of does to us. It almost removes our choice because we're reacting emotionally to something in a way that sort of inhibits our ability to think it through. So again, we might be right. We might, we might not. But but triggers are really an emotional reaction to something, a person, a comment, a situation that we cannot control. So that's the other thing. We want to put our efforts, our energy into what we can control. And what random things that people say or comments or the group they belong to or whatever that is, is not within our control. We don't control it. So we want to put our energy on something that is going to serve us and be useful. And these positive narratives have the power to do that. Mm. Yeah. So again, you can find lots of like jewels or gems like this in the book. <laughs> the Chinese book is Tong Xin Jie Qi, and you can find it in the in the shopping cart. And I, I I won't, you know, we don't have a lot of time. I won't cover all of it, but I think there are, there are eight triggers. There, I'll, I'll just read the name, but I think I will um, have uh, Sally comment on a few more because those are, again, so classic. You know, the one we talked about just now was visibility, right? So, like, you know, Jen not being, being seen. And number two is managing perceptions. Basically, how how do people think of me um, in, the, in, the, in the workplace? And the other one, uh, number three, called competence and confidence. Like, you know, I think all women know it's a big problem. Like, most women are 
le less confident um, and but they're actually very competent right so how do you how do you how do you actually you know draw a balance there and number four is called what are you trying to say like you know how do you understand different people's uh communicating styles and then number five is what uh Sally mentioned earlier is it's not fair I think that's very common too like we think um you know we're not being treated fairly and number six is called the grapevine and the network I think this is also very common for us like how do I know is there a hidden network here in the workplace that I'm not part of certain group or community I don't know what's going on um you know how do we really understand and and build a healthy uh, network and number seven called that's not funny right so like how do you you know what how do you differentiate between a good humor um and something probably be, you know crossing the line <laughs> uh and number eight the last one is attraction um the uncomfortable bits um so basically saying you know things that um attract you know attraction could play in workplace the things can become too close um, and that's actually also, we don't talk a lot about it, but it's also very common in workplace as well. So again, just judging from the names, you can probably already tell those are very common classic issues that everybody in workplace struggle with, of course, especially women. But I think, again, women is only one lens looking at a diverse workplace. Um, so here, I think, um, Sally, if, 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 if you don't mind, um, can we dig in a little bit deeper into the managing perception part and then the grapevine and network part? Because <laughs> I think those are probably things that, you know, most women struggle. Um, like, you know, especially, I think that especially perception goes back to a little bit of, of the being fake or authentic, right? People say, oh, I don't need to manage that because if I'm authentic, people would know. Like what, if you manage it, it's not authentic. <laughs> Can you tell us, you know, share a bit, like, you know, what's the, yeah, what is there to manage? <laughs> Those are two very good triggers to talk about in addition to visibility, which we have discussed. The trigger around managing perceptions is the amount of energy that you put into trying to control to some uh, degree or just being concerned about uh, how people see you. So this is very common with women to put a lot of energy into thinking about how does that person see me? I will tell you, I've been doing this a very long time. The most common question I get from women in women's leadership programs is, how can I be recognized for my achievements or what I contribute without anybody thinking that I'm arrogant or too ambitious or self-centered? Guess what? You probably can't. Somebody somewhere is going to think that of you. Maybe because they say it's a man, maybe because you know he's just not used to having women say what they think. Maybe it's because he's uncomfortable at the idea that maybe his wife would, would, would have similar aspirations. Maybe it's a woman who's uncomfortable with this because this goes against her beliefs about how women should be. Guess what? You can't control that. You can't make sure that everybody is going to think of you in exactly the way you want people to think of you. That's just not going to happen. So again, it's that idea of where's your circle of concern? What are you concerned about? How well does it match your circle of control? Things that you do control. You don't control what everyone thinks of you. And it's a futile question. And women can spend a lot of energy. Oh, I don't, I don't think that person likes me. Or I wonder what they're thinking. Or I wish I hadn't said that. Or maybe if I had said it differently, people would. We spend a lot of energy on that. Men don't, as a, as a rule. Men, Most men don't spend a huge amount of energy trying to figure out what everybody thinks of them. And that gives them just more opportunity to put resources into developing a satisfying career. So that's a positive thing. Now, on the other hand, men are uh, tend to undermanage perceptions. You know, their ideas just, uh, 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 not all of them, but a lot of them, you know, their ideas just, well, you know, I just say what I think. And, you know, if people don't like it, that's too bad. That's their problem. So that's not a great approach either. I'm, and I'm certainly not advocating that for women or the other for men. It's that idea of, I'm going to think through what is a, an effective way to be here? How can I best 
frame what I'm saying. Uh, what's What are the best words to use? Okay, I gave it my best effort. There we go. You know, people will judge me or not as as they wish. So that's that's really what I'm talking about is that where are we putting our energy when it comes to what other people think? Yeah. No, that's so classic. It was so interesting because we recently organized a lecture by uh, Weno Chizoko. She's uh, she's seventy six and she's one of the you know most renowned sociologists and you know work on gender issues in Japan. And of course, then <clears throat> there's a question very similar, saying, "Oh, you know, I you know now our company is promoting diversity, um, so they want more women in leadership roles, and then you know as a result, I think I have a higher chance of being promoted, but." On the other hand, also, I feel, you know, this is probably not good because I don't want to be promoted because there's a certain quota. Uh, you know, how do I deal with it? And then when, when she was asking that question, um, you know, um, Professor Wendell was just laughing. And she said, you know, why I'm laughing? She said, because a man will never ask that question. <laughs> like, doesn't care. If it helps me, yes, bring it right. on. Exactly. <laughs> Great, terrific. I'll take whatever advantage I can get. You know, yeah. we, we, women always do that. When I first started in the workplace, women will always be, you know, I'm so worried. I don't want people to, th you know, I don't want to get a promotion because they think I'm cute or whatever. You know, guys like, okay, whatever, whatever helps. So yeah. yes, exactly. She's exactly right. <laughs> She's like, even that question is wasting your time. <laughs> so that's you said. Yeah. You, can, you can put energy to our work and get you advanced faster. <laughs> That's exactly right. Exactly. Right, right. Okay, how about the next one? The grapevine and then the network. And yeah. the network. This is so important. It has to do with how we build our networks of allies, how we build the support that will help us create careers that are satisfying and rewarding. So one thing about networks is, as we all know, and this is true all around the world, there tend to be sort of old boys networks that are very effective at helping those who are, are part of it, part of the in-group, part of that network, to get promotions, to get recognized, to move into partnerships if it's a partnership firm, et cetera. So that's very common. Now things are changing and in some cultures and some organizations, there are more women who are actually part of the old boys network, but it still operates in that same way as being a source of referrals and promotions, et cetera. What I've been fascinated by is as women's networks have evolved more, they have, they begun women have begun to recognize that this is a very useful way to run a network. Uh, when, uh, for example, with uh, women's networks, internal networks, uh, employee resource groups, as they're often called in organizations, in the beginning, it was mostly women sort of talking about, you know, why aren't there any women in this position? Why aren't there any women in that position? Important conversation to have. But it wasn't people weren't necessarily helping one another and saying, okay, we're part of this network. Let's make this network uh, a necessary resource because we're referring other, we're referring our network members for jobs that we know. We're promoting them. We're helping them gain greater visibility. That's the sort of networking attitude. And that's why I say that, that outsider networks have traditionally uh, operated more as grapevines, that is spreading information, but not necessarily being resources to help one another. So what's been bad about the old boys network is that it's tended to be quite exclusive. But what's been good has been that it, it, it helps people develop skills so that they can leverage relationships in the service of one another. And I think that that's a great model in that way for women, but losing the exclusivity part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other is so interesting because in, in Japan, I've been writing some articles basically criticizing the work culture here. And one of them is this old boys network. And then even today, they have those networks where clubs where it's men only. Um, and the only woman that can show up are their waitress. <laughs> I was like, wow. No, I've like worked in Japan. I've seen it. <laughs> I know. And then and then there's a, a still a very wide social acceptance for that. Not only acceptance, people look up to it saying, well, I want to be in that group. Right. So like it's 
it's creating that I was like, well, it feels so backwards, but it's widely accepted and because it's linked with privilege and power. Um, and um, so like it's, but losing the exclusivity part, I think that's exactly the problem because that's where people see the value is, right? So like, you know, the reason we have this network is because it's exclusive. You have to be graduate of this school or, you know, being this part of this family or, or all that. So like, isn't that an intrinsic challenge that this networks can't address itself? I, I actually don't think the exclusivity is the reason those networks are so effective. I think it's how they operate. I think it's their operating model of using leverage to help one another. It, mm -hmm. it feels as if, you know, because they're exclusive, everybody aspires to being part of them. Let me give you an example. It was a group I was writing about. Um, and this is a group of female political operatives uh, they were in New York and they had been shut out of a big meeting by, it was a, a, a black and Latino female uh, political operatives. They'd been shut out of a big meeting of male black and Latino political operatives. They hadn't been invited. So they decided to have their own meeting, which of course the men then crashed. But that got them sort of meeting and getting together on a regular basis, these women. And they did this for a couple of years and they would help one another with, you know, problems they were having with their kids or, you know, they'd be a place where they could talk about, you know, taking care of elderly parents, et cetera, et cetera. But they weren't going anywhere. They had this wonderful network of support, but they weren't going anywhere. And then they got the idea that they were going to do what the, what the men did in terms of recommending one another, in terms of always being on the lookout in their own organization. Is there an opening? Are they looking for someone? Can I recommend uh, uh, someone from this network? Can I get them in the door and before the right people? And after a couple of years of operating that way, they actually were more powerful than the male network and they were very open you know they would take in other women who you know who were in the same field and but it became very desirable because the fruits of it were obvious these women were getting promotions they were i mean the white house press secretary was one of those women she was knocking on doors and stuffing envelopes before this group shifted to this orientation of, of mutual support. So I actually don't think the exclusivity is it. From the outside, we think that. It's like, oh, I wanna get in. It's like, you know, back in the day when they would have velvet ropes in front of clubs, you think, oh, I wanna get in there. Then you get in, you think, what am I doing here? Who cares? But you know, you wanted to get in because you were being kept out. So I think there's a little more of something like that. Oh yeah, that's wonderful. I think it was when you were talking, I was thinking there's almost sort of this this paradox. Um, meaning on the one hand, if you look at anthropology or sociology, like women are much better at building communities. Yes. Um, than men, right? So this is very innate and intrinsic that comes naturally. It's a natural talent for most women. Like you make friends and you connect. But on the other hand, when you get to workplace, that seemed to be a weak point again. Because I think there's a probably one sort of mental on the barrier, and people think, okay, I'm, I can, I can meet friends, I can, you know, be happy. But if now I use it for some practical purpose, now suddenly I'm recommending my friend Sally for a job. Oh, that's dirty, you know, like you know, that's not touching. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> like, <laughs> sometimes it does not work. Like, <laughs> how do you overcome that? <laughs> Well, that's, uh, and you put your finger on it. I mean, I, I started dealing with this a number of years ago. I, I recognized, you know, why, why isn't women's capacity to build strong relationships more of an advantage in the workplace? Why is that not a bigger advantage? Then I began to realize that although women were great at building relationships, they are often reluctant to leverage relationships. That in, is to engage people with uh, a tactical that is job related or strategic career related request. They're often reluctant to do that. So when I realized that I would start asking women, are you good at this? Oh no, I'm terrible at this. Well, why? 
well, um, I believe that, you know, I, I don't want to be a user or I, I, I want people to understand that I really value them as friends. Well, can't you value someone as a friend that you want to help and invest in their career? We somehow got the idea that this is not a very nice behavior, even though it actually helps other people as well as ourselves. So getting over that is really, really important, I think, for women, that idea that, that, that that's a bad behavior, that that's not really being a friend or a nice person. And, yeah. and recognizing the importance of that and then using that in how we build relationships. And if we feel reluctant, for, first of all, if we feel reluctant to, um, uh, to, to do something like that, to ask for help, we need to recognize that the number one value people find in giving help to people is it makes them feel good about themselves. So why would we deprive other people of the chance to feel good about themselves? How exactly is that being such a wonderful person? Um, and also we can just do it first. You know, can I help you? Is there something you'd like to be recommended for? Can I nominate you, et cetera? It's a very, very proactive and positive way uh, to build relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Cause I think there's a certain element of shame um that women have right so i'm trying to get to the bottom of it as well i was like well that's been the reason i say that because i have it too it's not like i i i'm so good at just using relationship me too yeah right because we think if we gave something oh that's noble right so like you know i'm selfless uh a selfishness so like uh, uh so i i i you know i'm doing you a service but the moment I'm asking you, oh, can you write me a recommendation letter? Like, can you reintroduce me to your friend? Um, well, not now, okay, now like it seems like, oh, my true face comes out. Okay, the, all the reason I'm doing a relation with Sally is for this moment where I can use her. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm a terrible person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me tell you a funny story about that. This is real. Uh, my colleague, Marshall Goldsmith, who I wrote uh, How Women Rise With, because it was kind of took the the leadership model of his book, uh, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, huge bestseller. So I realized from working with What Got You Here in my own work that it wasn't appropriate for women necessarily. He had all these you know, behaviors that you need to learn, you know, learn to apologize, stuff like that. Really, women, are you kidding me? I go around the world and all that happens is women are apologizing. Okay. So, it just, you know, don't always talk about how great you are. No, it doesn't work for women. So I wanted to suggest to him that we take his model, but we collaborate on a book that looked at the habits and behaviors most likely to undermine successful women, which is what he'd done with what got you here. It was the habits and behaviors undermine successful people. So I wanted to ask him for two years. Now I've been around a long time and had a very good career and good profile. And I didn't want to ask him because I felt like number one, oh, he'll think that I'm just doing this because he had a million seller book. So I want to horn in on his success or, oh, he'll think I'm doing this because he's got a million and a half LinkedIn followers and he thinks I want to you know, get in on that. So I did not ask him. We, we were both on a retreat for professionals, people in our field of leadership. And we had this exercise where half the people were supposed to draw a name out of a hat and then they get someone's name and then they go up to that person and say, how can I help you? So he drew my name out of the hat and he came up to me and he said, Sally, how can I help you? And I just blurted it out. I thought, okay, now or never. I said, you can collaborate with me on a book uh, you, about habits and behaviors most likely to get in women's way using the model of what got you here. And I'm ready for him to, you know, stalk away or something. Oh, you're trying to use me. And he says, you know what? That's great. He said, I need to help build up my credibility and profile with women. There are more and more women in the audiences I'm speaking with. And I think if I collaborated with you, that would help me with women. In other words, he, of course, was thinking how it would benefit him, not right. how I was trying to benefit from him. So he just said, what a great idea. This will really help me. So that taught me a 
big lesson about what we assume people will think. I was trying to manage perceptions, uh, and what and what they may actually think. And I and he was thinking like a man there, and it was good <laughs> for both of us. <laughs> Indeed, well, that's a great story. I thank you have to thank you for that hat, though, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sit here in front of you, but I want to share a little bit. I think there's a shame factor because this is also especially true for Asian women. Yeah. Because I think culture again, there's you know we all know like there is you know there is certain image where women should be. I think you know in the Western culture is the same, but I think Asia is probably has an added layer um, with this tradition or whatever the domestic role that the women are playing. So that shame factor is very common. So the way I deal with it is it, it is. So I use this analogy. So as if if you are buying something, okay? So if you go out, you go shopping. You go shopping. So you're, for example, you're, you're shopping for paints or whatever, like, you know, common stuff. Yeah. And you see a good thing and you wanted it, right? So you, you want it, you want it, you, you're willing to pay for it. You know, the, the person who's selling this good pen to you, there's no shame. Like, in a, it's like, you know, it's not like, wow, I'm selling this pen so expensive, you know, you know, 20% higher than the other pens. Um, and you know, this woman picked it. I'm so shameful that I charged her more. No, right? And then you as the buyer, you're happy you got this pen. Um, you know, for 20% more. You're saying, well, if I don't buy it now, maybe like I miss it, or you know, or maybe you know, next year will be 50% more. So so like when we are in this very simple transaction, there's no shame. Like even for women, like you go, you go to, to market, you know, buy vegetables. It's the same yeah. thing, like you see something that's good. And you pay for it, right? So there isn't like the seller. Imagine if you are the farmer selling the vegetable, you don't feel ashamed that you know, like so suddenly my my exactly. thing, my, right? This is so, so embarrassing. I, Someone brought <laughs> bought an eggplant. No, exactly. <laughs> like my eggplant of half a year of my work. So I use that analogy to kind of break my own habit. I was like, you know, if I'm asking something, is as if I were the person selling that good pen, or if I were the person selling that good eggplant, and if they say no, that means well, it's not you know, worth it, or well, at least not the worth of the market value. If they say yes, means there is a market for it, right? So like, as if I'm the pen seller. So, so like when you treat it like that, you, you kind of do away with whatever this cultural things, all those nonsense or the noise I coming into your mind. Yeah. So treat it as a normal everyday transaction, which we all, we, we are all on the other side, because when you're buying, you're sort of the man in the relationship, right? Yeah. So you're the dominant person, because you're the one with the money. And we are actually in that role very often. Like when we go to a convenience store, you know, to to to, to do like the everyday stuff. So I think that helped me to kind of get out that thing. So like, you know, so if I'm selling gas, I'm not ashamed of selling gas. Your, your car needs gas. Right? So, so so that was the, I think you, if we can use that to kind of untangle ourselves from that and, and treating as an everyday thing on the other side kind of gave us a bit of a psychological space of allowing ourselves to be in that role. Well, I think this is a wonderful analogy, and it's partly because, I mean, go back to Marshall's response to me, it was transactional. That's right. what his response was. You know, this is helpful to me. This will get yeah. me more credibility with women. And I think that that, that that trends, maybe it's just that men have been in the workplace for so much longer. I mean, really, it's remarkable. I've been you know, the changes I've seen in 35 years are extraordinary. You know, women are so much more confident, they have much more solidarity with one another, they're more skillful at trying to enlist men as allies. So all these changes are, are positive, but we forget how recent they are and what outsiders women really have been to the workplace and certainly to leadership roles. So I think this transactional mentality is sort of something we struggle with when it comes to relationships. Right. Whereas we bring a more domestic uh, side that emphasizes warmth and support and care uh, to people in, in our relationships. And so we're trying to bring that to work. And it's a great thing. This is not saying this should not be brought to work. We have played an extraordinary role in humanizing the workplace. We've changed how uh, excellence in leadership is understood to be much more, you know, we have 
I, I was working at uh, West Point, <laughs> you know, the, the military academy here. They have courses on empathy. Now, this would never have happened if women hadn't come into West Point. And they just sort of changed the idea. So these are very positive things. But if we don't see them in their fullness or their totality, don't also, as you're talking about, see the transactional side of people thinking, how can this benefit me? How can we benefit one another? Then we lose something. We lose power and we lose confidence and we lose authority. Yeah, absolutely. You're so right. It's almost, I think it's almost there's a transaction trap as well. Because we, uh, the word we think of a transaction is negative. No, it's not negative. It's every day. You know, without transaction, the world doesn't run. Right? We actually are part of it. Um, but like, so, so like you can actually build on top of it. It doesn't have to be only transaction. It's transaction based on, you know, mutual respect, uh, you know, a mutual benefit. But it's, yeah. And then the other thing when you take it, it, it sort of reminded me, I think the reason women are so used to sort of doing only focus on the non-transactional part is because, you know, women do most of the non-paid job, right? Yes, so like, I think- Exactly. <laughs> it's not much of a transaction. <laughs> exactly. So you, you work for nothing. And that's yeah. what your role is supposed to be in family. You raise your children for nothing. You care for the, <laughs> you, you do the cleaning, you do the housework. So I think that was it. So like, you know, there's all this UN data saying on average in the world, women do like 2.6 times um, non-paid work than men, right? So like, and I think all of us do, I do it. I certainly do a lot of housework. So I get, you know, I think that's why for us, we kind of bring that sort of part of ourselves to the workplace as well. You almost feel bad of receiving receiving money for what you do. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I remember my mother, she was a college professor and I remember she used to say, you know, I, I can't believe they're paying me for this job. I would love to do this job for free. Really? What? You know, I mean, at the time I thought, oh, you're such a nice person, but it was just really that guilt or that embarrassment about yeah. being paid for something she was doing. And I, I think that's a very good insight you've had that it's kind of rooted in the fact that we do so much work for free. So, yeah. and we think of that as part of our identity or part of being a wonderful person, wife, mother, whatever. I'm a good yeah. housekeeper. So that's all good. But, you know, it, it. I think it makes it hard to switch over to a more transactional mindset. And I know this from programs I'll do when talking about leveraging relationships and all. Women will all, all, often raise their hand and say, I don't want to be transactional about it. And okay, fine, you know, put another frame around it. Um, but but I think what you say is really important. Yeah, it's true, indeed. Because you was a because I think because I was triggered by your thought. You were saying men are so good at it because they work place for so long. Yeah, they've been for thousands of years. <laughs> and right? they've been negotiating and defining their work and working on their brand and doing all that stuff. And we're sort of new to it for many of us, our mothers. I mean, my mother worked, but this was her attitude. Oh, they don't need to pay me. So, you know, this is, we're, we're yeah, we've only been in this a uh, 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 generation or two. Mostly. Yeah, yeah. Game of about, about 100 years and they're, they've been added for thousands. Yeah. No, you <laughs> Like <laughs> so, we need to learn from them, and then but but kind of maintain, as you said, maintaining both. It's not like now we're becoming men, but yeah. saying okay, we're not bringing what we have. But you you have to understand the the rule of this game, which is everybody. If you play, it bring value, you get compensated, right? Sure. So if it's not compensated, then this place is not fair, and then you should speak about it and change it. Um, wonderful. Okay, and I think the last piece I want to use about last ten minutes we have on um, your part two of the book. Yes. So again, part one, talk about this five, this, the eight uh, triggers. Again, you, know, you can get this book in the shopping cart. And then um, we only picked three, you know, actually maybe two, but they're all of them are very interesting and classic. I think get to some of the roots of the issues. Um, so you will read it um, in the book when you have it yourself. But then the, um, so the last part is about basically how to build, like, you know, understanding the trigger is the problem, right? So like, you know, you define and analyze and you understand. And then the second is really around, the second part is really around what to do with it. Um, yeah, maybe can you share with us what, you know, because you, you talk a lot about about daily behaviors, um, yeah. things you could do to build a inclusive um, environment. Um, are, are those 
more to the behavior for the men because I was, you know, like, or like, I, I think it's both sides, right? So like, you know, if you can share a few behaviors, you think sure. that that's, yeah, both work for the women who is trying to be connected, you know, in this system or for people who are actually really generally thinking about building a, a better organization. What are some of the behaviors that's, that's no regret, no regret moves? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of them is to think about, think more broadly about who you invite into a meeting or, you know, what opportunities you provide for, for example, younger people in the organization to watch how leaders are doing things. I mean, watch them doing it. An example here that, that had a big influence on me. Many years ago, I was uh, doing diary studies of very successful women leaders of whom there weren't that many. This is like, I was doing these in the late eighties. And this one woman, Frances Esselbein, uh, who was at that point the national executive director of the Girl Scouts. This was in New York. I went to her office and I was following her around and she had a telephone meeting with the New York Times uh, over some controversy that was you know, kind of difficult to deal with. And one thing that always stuck with me is that what she did was she had the time set for that call with a reporter and she called in all the young staffers in the communication department. There were about 15 of them. And she had them come in to the meeting. Uh, she, she had them come in about 15, 20 minutes beforehand. They talked about what the issue was. She served them tea and cookies. And then she took the call and she said, just, uh, I thought you'd, it would be helpful to, to, watch you know how i'm handling it and so then she handled it and it was difficult and you know a little bit contentious from the reporter and she handled it with great grace and aplomb and then it was over she did it on a speakerphone she hung it up and then she spent about a half an hour talking to the young women you know what did you think of when i said this uh when that reporter said this what would you have said so she was really teaching them something that, that young people never get. She was giving them an active lesson in, they were in communications, in how a communications challenge is handled well at the most senior level. Now, this is a very, very profoundly inclusive behavior. She's saying to those young staffers, I, I value your participation and I want to share with you how this is how this can be done one way this can be done so she's saying to them i have a feeling that you're going to be in a position of leadership one day and that it will be helpful for you to see that now this is in contrast to so many organizations where meetings are very stratified and then somebody will get an idea oh let's be more inclusive let's invite some junior people so they'll invite the junior people and all the senior people are seated around the big conference table. The junior people are in the back of the room. They're told to participate, but if they say anything, then their boss has to turn around and look at them so they don't say anything. And then they get criticized. Well, we tried to include them, but they didn't, they didn't seem to want to participate. So it's just a very thoughtless way of doing so. So thinking about how how we run meetings, how we include people in the meetings, how we use meetings for training and the and the inclusion of people at different levels. That's really important. Um, being able to listen in a very active way. And that means not, you know, thinking in our head, okay, this person's almost done. Uh, what will I say? You know, it means actually listening this is a very interesting thing in virtual, in the way it's working in virtual, because what I've noticed, and I've had to discipline it myself, of course, is that making a commentary on what other people are saying, oh, great, yeah, good idea, hmm, not sure how that would work. What you're doing is you're hijacking the camera, for example, if you're on Zoom. And it looks as if you're interrupting, and it's perceived that way. And that sort of amplifies the fact that constantly confirming other people 
which many of us think of as a, a positive and inclusive behavior is actually sort of hijacking the conversation. So how well do we listen? How actively do we listen? One example I give in the book, Peter Drucker, who was one of the you know leadership gurus of the entire 20th century, you know, in the top three or so. I, I saw him, I was lucky to have the opportunity uh, before he his 95th birthday of watching him in action. And what I saw, he had this policy that he always spoke last. In any meeting he was in, he spoke last. And it was a kind of discipline. I mean, he was doing it partly because he was always, you know, the elder statesman. So the minute he said something that would influence what other people would say. But it was a real discipline for him to sit there and just, you know, listen to everybody without making a comment and then finally speak his piece at the end. And he could then reference people as so-and-so said, as so-and-so said, which is very flattering to people who are not at a senior level when they're included like that. So these are, you know, just a couple examples um, including the person in a meeting who's sort of the difficult person, the squeaky wheel, as we call that, um, including them, because we understand that if we get their thoughts, even though they may make the meeting longer, then it'll get buy-in in the organization. So all kinds of small practices like this that really add up to understanding how we engage people, how we make them feel as if they're part of something, as if they're, as if the organization or the team is a we, not a they. Hmm. Well, thank you so much. I actually have Peter Drucker's book. <laughs> was... <laughs> yeah, and... the Japanese book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was a, uh... yeah, he had, no, well, I, well, you're so lucky to be actually in his presence. I didn't know that because he, yeah, yeah. he's such a, oh. Yeah, well, which is much that. older. He was the mentor of that woman, Frances Hesselbein, that I was mentioning, who ran the meeting where she had the young people in. And um, so I was very fortunate um, that Peter probably died in the early 90s to have that opportunity to spend time with him and observe him. Yeah, wow, that's so powerful. And, and I think what it's um the first example you mentioned is so interesting because again, a you know Iran across or against some of the common beliefs like about an organization, especially a large one, need to have a hierarchy. Yeah, and is certain communication uh exclusivity, right? <laughs> so I mean, again, those are true. Yes, it's not like everything we have to blast out to the entire organization, but I think there is a overuse of that. Basically, that kind of you know or who is copied on the email is an indicator of your status in the organization. So there, there are a lot of like between the lines things there, which become another, almost the karma of the organization, I think, is because it feels, you, you squeeze out the possibility of true communication and true development. Um, and then those are things you don't learn um, by, by, by watching a YouTube, you, you actually learn there when it's live. And, and, then, and those, fact, those, those examples are so powerful and what you have shown. Um, but again, for the book, actually, there are, there are more. So the, the book, the, the last, uh, yeah, so there, there are three um, three chapters. So that, no, yes, there are 12 chapters total in the book. And then the first eight is on the triggers and there's a, a beginning chapter and also the three chapters on, on behaviors like what just Sally mentioned. But again, there is a, you know, a, a, a basic treasure pot of all those kind of behaviors you can read in the book by yourself. And again, you can you can find a book in the shopping cart as I go with Chucky Kanda to Ben Shu. Alrighty. Okay. Now thank you so much again, Sally. It's such a pleasure talking to you and share thank you for sharing your years of experience through those writings and of course through what you just shared. I'm sure everybody benefited tremendously from um from your from your book already and from this conversation. Thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation. And I'm really going to remember your metaphor about transactional uh, you know, getting comfortable with the idea that we we use transactional model when we buy things and getting more comfortable. And then the the fact that women may shy back from that because we do so much unpaid work. Right. <laughs> Very insightful. <laughs> That's why we need to say ourselves, hey, you have 80% unpaid, this 20% you get paid. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs>
So it diminishes our ability to value what we contribute. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're sort of um, inertiated. I think like there's a kind of inertia there and say, ah, you know, this is how I do it. I'll just bring it to work. You know, like, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's just been wonderful speaking with you.